Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The United States is at a crossroads. Regrettably, all of us listened to our parents, teachers, and Walt Disney, who conspired to convince us that we should believe in ourselves. And now, everyone believes in themselves. It's a disaster. We believe in ourselves and thus believe that our ideas, preferences, and personal beliefs hold universal authority. When daily life demonstrates that our beliefs are not universal, we push back, sometimes violently, to silence all those who threaten our mental perfection. Did I say mental? Yes, I did. We are mental. The problem with mental perfection is that it's a fraud. We enshrine ourselves in a temple dedicated to self-serving ideals and declare ourselves the perfect example of the righteousness of these ideals. Religious people do it, liberals and conservatives do it, and those who seek power love it because you can ride self-righteousness like a tidal wave all the way to the top. The perfection that Jesus demands in the Gospel of Matthew is different. It's a perfection that shames us and strips us of power. It's a perfection that makes clear in no uncertain terms that we are not to believe in ourselves, that we are a fraud, that we cannot accomplish the most basic requirements of human morality, let alone the demands of the Torah. It's a perfection that can only be realized in our defeat on the cross, the symbol of a teaching that consigns all perfection to the dead. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 40 to 48. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 251 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Last week we talked about the way in which Matthew emphasizes over and over again with the same intensity as 1 Corinthians, Richard, that we fall short. This commandment in verse 38 about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which everybody ridicules judges everyone because everyone falls short of this instruction. And so we've been hammered, we've been put down, and even those of us who are self-righteous and believe in our own altruism and humanity have been shut down by the instruction that we are not to take more than an eye for an eye. We're put in this position of weakness, and now the Lord begins to explain as a father explains to children who have been scolded, now that you've heard and accepted my assessment of you, let me tell you how you should conduct yourself. Resist not evil is so counterintuitive for the same reason you go beyond not taking more than a tooth for a tooth. You take nothing for a tooth. Don't resist any bad that's been done to you because there's only one person, one opinion, one being who matters, and that's God, the one who's going to judge you. And this is what I emphasized in Ephesus school. There's only one opinion that you're allowed to care about, and it's not the one who knocked your tooth out. You can't care what that person thinks of you. And this is the hardest part of the teaching, I think, is that you're not allowed to listen or to care. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt let him have your coat also. Again, Richard, it's 1 Corinthians. It's so clear, the parallel, that you are being presented now with this rule that those who accept 
the teaching of the cross, the word of the cross as Paul presents it in 1 Corinthians. Those who submit to this teaching have to accept the same laws that Jesus accepted on the cross. Right. There's one law that we actually care about, and that's the one from God. The other ones are inconsequential. And even when they feel consequential or look consequential, they are not consequential. You're not allowed to protect yourself. If something is taken away from you, it's because it's being taken away from you simply, and you keep moving. You aren't allowed to say, was it just? Was it not just? Well, if they're going to take that, then I'm going to make sure I keep this. You're not allowed. Whatever they're going to take, they're going to take. If they're going to take more, they're going to take more. If they're going to hit you once, you let them hit you again. You can't care. The human authorities, they're going to do what they're going to do. They're sent from God. You accept it. Keep moving. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul gives an instruction to the church. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? I've referred to this a few times over the past couple of episodes, Richard, because the reason you are not to go before the unrighteous, what does Paul mean by the unrighteous? He means to go before those who are not governed by the righteous teaching. If you go before the unrighteous and you explain that someone wants to take your shirt, the judge is going to be fair in human terms and make sure everything is split fairly. But according to the law of the cross, which is what we're dealing with here, the one law, so to speak, according to this law, which summarizes the Torah for the addressee in Matthew, there is no human judgment to appeal to. You have to appeal to the righteousness of the saints, which is the righteousness of this text. And according to this righteousness, We know that you have to be perfect, which means that you can't sue them. There is no discussion. You have to let him have your coat also. I want to keep stressing this. These texts are parallel. I am not inserting Paul into Matthew. Matthew is reflecting Paul's teaching. It's the same teaching. They are different texts written in different situations, But the principle, the content, is the same. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Again, I hearken back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you go to your parents and you make the case before a human court that it's not fair, I already went one mile with my sister, why can't someone else go the second mile? Your parents are going to have mercy on you. But if you appeal to the righteousness of the teaching, as Paul prescribes in 1 Corinthians, Scripture is going to tell you to go the second mile. And if you keep pushing the issue, it's going to say, carry him the third and the fourth and the fifth mile. And you're going to say, but that's impossible. And Matthew's going to tell you, that's why you're unrighteous. But yeah, exactly. There is no way of reaching this level of righteousness. Jesus is setting the bar so high. I mean, he's spelling out here in these verses in 38 through 42 what he's talking about in the Beatitudes. When you're going to be treated badly, rejoice, be happy, and just keep moving. You cannot resist evil. You cannot push back. If you get hit, be ready to be hit again. If someone takes your clothing, be ready to give more clothing. If they punish you to walk a mile, you have to give them another mile. You are not allowed to resist anything. So much of what we try to do in American society, in human society, is to build up walls and protect ourselves and to push back on people and to keep people from taking advantage of us. And everyone is going to say, oh, are you saying, Dr. Benton, that we're supposed to allow people to walk all over us? Yes, that's what we're supposed to do. And your resistance to being walked all over demonstrates your lack of righteousness. It demonstrates that you don't actually believe in the Beatitudes. You don't believe what Jesus is teaching. And I don't think you can understand what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew, and I'm going to keep stressing this point, Richard, until you've read Paul's letters. They go hand in hand. Because here, if you take Matthew in a vacuum outside of the canon, you can make out of Matthew chapter 5 in this last section you can make out of it your altruism, which is what people do all the time. Politicians co-opt this all the time, but it's a farce because they co-opt it for their righteousness, and then it becomes 
vanity. It becomes empty. It becomes powerless. You have to be put in your place. My advice to everyone listening to the Gospel of Matthew on the podcast, in your spare time, go back and listen in parallel to our exegesis of 1 Corinthians, because there's no way you can really get Matthew. There's no way you can say what we're saying about Matthew without Paul. So please make the effort, because if you don't, you're going to eventually come around and say, well, Father Mark, but really, is that really practical? And I'm saying, yes, it's impractical, and it applies. The point of that passage in 1 Corinthians is not, don't go to court in the world, but go to court in the church. That's not what it's saying. It's saying you have to submit to what happens. If you're going before those who are holy within the church, they're the ones who have been transformed by this teaching in the way that they think, and they understand. And they're going to say, Father Mark, it's fine. Just keep moving. Why are you losing time on this? Why are you resisting them? Let me remind you what Jesus said about people who take your cloak. Give him the rest of your clothing and move on. That's what they're going to say. This is the correct teaching for someone who's coming with a complaint against someone else in the group. Don't you remember what Jesus said in the Beatitudes that you're supposed to rejoice in being mistreated? So let's just keep going. Nothing now is preventing you from teaching or living the gospel, so keep going. This is the point that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians. And he emphasizes that point yet again. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So that's four verses where he's explained repeatedly. You have to lose. You have to lose. You have to lose. You have to lose. And then, Richard, we come to verse 43 where Jesus presents us yet again with another commandment from the Old Testament. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The problem that people have with this verse, of course, is hate thine enemy because, oh, I'm a Christian. I don't hate anybody, even though Jesus goes out of his way to prove that you actually do hate people. But anyway, people like to think, oh, I don't hate anybody. Oh, who would follow a teaching like this? What this teaching is saying is make sure the people who are close to you, you're treating correctly. Jesus is trying to show that the bar was set low. I'm going to set the bar where it's supposed to be. Now, just because the bar was set low doesn't mean it was easy for you. I mean, look at how many people who profess to be Christians and how they don't hate anybody mistreat so many people close to them in their lives. It's laughable. Christians who say, oh, of course, can't even follow this teaching as straightforward and simple as it is, it's just natural law. I mean, my daughter said people biologically take care of their families, but people don't. <laughs> they, they somehow even lack the ability to do the most basic things. The point is not that you learn how to do the most basic things. It's that Jesus always pushes the bar as high as it's going to go towards love and service of the neighbor. This is the direction that Jesus is going. The key thing about this verse is that we have to be very practical in our application of the word neighbor. Because if people followed verse 43, as it is written in Leviticus, that you have to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, they would be forced to embrace the immigrant. Because a neighbor is someone who is in close proximity to you in the land. Father Paul deals with this in the rise of Scripture. So we tend to, as Platonists and Hellenists, Put people into these categories that we invent, person of that group or person of that persuasion or whatever. Scripture doesn't care about any of that. Neighbor is a very literal term. It means the person in close proximity to you in the land. It shows no deference to what kind of person is in close proximity to you in the land. And the enemy is someone who is not close to you in the land. So once someone is your neighbor, it doesn't matter how you perceive them or what you think they are. They are someone that you have to love. So, of course, the way that we twist this commandment is to say, I'm going to love the people who I consider a neighbor and hate the people who I consider an enemy. But you're taking the control away from God's law into your own hands. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So with the explanation in verse 44, even if you try to decide that someone who is in close proximity to you is an enemy, you're stuck because the Lord just said, if you're really getting 
the point of the instruction, you don't have any enemies. In some manuscripts, they add, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. So some scribe wanted to reemphasize here that you're supposed to not just rejoice that this is happening to you. You have to love the ones who are doing it to you. Americans talk as if they do this. This is what's amazing to me. When they can talk the nastiest, vilest language about people from another political party or from a different socioeconomic class, but then say they don't hate anybody and they love everybody. You do good to those who hate you. It's not talking about the disposition of your heart. Do good things for them, not only to accept the one who hits you or accept the one who takes your cloak. Or accept the one who forces you to walk a mile, who forces you to give them money. You have to do good for them. This is where the true challenge comes. It's not about loving in your heart. It's about action. It's cheap talk to talk about the love in your heart. It's when the rubber hits the road and you have to do something for them and you help them and you make their life easier in spite of what they did for you. This is where we are not able to reach the bar that Jesus set. We can't do it. It is beyond our ability, yet Jesus plants this idea firmly in our mind. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This is a beautiful verse. It means that everybody puts their pants on the same way in the morning, but it's more than that. It means that the Lord is the judge of all the earth. His rains fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. The sun shines on the evil and the good. It has echoes of Ecclesiastes. And the problem in our country right now is that half of the people believe that the sun only shines on them because they're right and the rain only falls on them because they're blessed. But the Lord is merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and looks at all of creation, which includes all of the people in the earth. He looks at creation in totality. He looks upon everyone the same. There is no distinction between one kind of a person and another kind of a person, whether it's based on identity, status, or behavior. Even based on behavior, according to Matthew chapter 5, Richard, because the Lord just showed that we're all unrighteous. It has echoes of Romans 2. You're judging the Gentiles, but you yourself are doing the same things. So you better be really thankful that the rain falls on the just and on the unjust because you're unjust. Thank you for saying this, Father, because I was just reading an article about the origins of the United States and the self-righteousness that comes at the moment of conception of the United States. When the first pilgrims came over here through difficult times on their ships, crossing was difficult and finding enough food was difficult, and they would pray to God very piously, God, please look upon us with favor and help us get through this time. And then once they got through that time, they said, aha, God looks upon us with favor. And this was the moment when it all started to fall apart at the moment of conception, because they believed that they had the right and they believed that they were righteous because God showed favor on them because of their prayer. This is where it all falls apart. And what happened is that They already had favor. Once they had favor, then why do you have to be held to this level of righteousness that Jesus lays out? Well, significantly, this break in verse is very unfortunate between verses 44 and 45, because you have to do good to those that hate you and bless those that curse you so that you can be children of your father. There's this unfortunate break between verses 44 and 45. Because you bless those that curse you and you love your enemies so that you can be children of your father. You must do these things to be children of your father. It's not because you prayed this prayer. It's not because you got through this difficult time in your life. It's because today you must love your enemies and pray for those that curse you. As we read at the beginning of the chapter in the Beatitudes, you must accept these things that are happening to you. You must accept 
the persecutions. And you must perform good works so that your Father who is in heaven is glorified. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You have to push yourself to be perfect. You have to understand that the law of God is pushing you to give everything for your neighbor, and it's not enough to take care of your own. The culture war in the United States is ridiculous because the expression family first is anti-scriptural. It is anti-scriptural in such a profound way that I'm willing to even say that it's the teaching of the Antichrist. Because the Lord Jesus Christ did not come for his family. He came for everyone. And that is the point. It's not enough to love your own. In fact, loving your own works against you. It's no credit at all. You have to love the others. I'm going to twist a little bit what you said, Father. I don't disagree, but I'm going to add a little twist to it. God did come for his children, but don't assume that you're one of his children. He is coming for his children who are the ones who follow this law and the ones who are blessing those that curse them and are loving their enemies. Those are the children he's coming for. Are you one of these children? Can you claim to be one of these children? This is where it's tricky. Jesus is making fun of people in verses 46 and 47. You know what? Uh, you know, you love your kids. Great. So does Stalin. Big deal. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I tell you, Richard, that's the point, right? In Galatians, Paul is very clear. Just like in Deuteronomy, the Lord is very clear. The Lord can put you in and take you out. The Israel of God are those who walk according to his teaching. That's the point about adoption in the New Testament, which reflects the teaching of the Old Testament. So there's this ominous premise that underlies all of this. Don't even assume, don't even assume that you're a son of Abraham and Matthew, as we discussed earlier in the book. Don't make that assumption. And let me show you how tenuous your status as a son of Abraham is. It's a very poignant point that you raise. My dog takes care of her puppies without a problem. She doesn't need the gospel to do that. But we need the gospel to make sure that we're taking care of those who are hitting us, who are forcing us to do what we don't want to do, and taking the things that belong to us. Once we love them, then we have a chance of showing that we are children of our Father who is in heaven. But I think Jesus is going to ruin even that shred of hope that we still have. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you very much, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.